moving forward, we are going to hear about the introduction to bioactive materials uh, utilizing bioglass. And, and this is some really amazing cutting edge stuff that you're gonna hear from, uh, from a, a good friend of mine and somebody that I respect greatly, Dr. John Kanka. Um, John graduated from uh, Yukon School of Dental Medicine, Go Huskies. Uh, and he completed a residency at Waterbury Hospital and practices in Middlebury, Connecticut. The, this guy has come a long way in, uh, and brought us with him in that regard. He gave great validation to the etching of Denton, um, discovered the concept of wet bonding and created the pulse activation protocol of resin composites and the fourth generation of Denton bonding agents. I love to tell people that when I was in school, um, you could flunk a composite if you got any etch on Denton. And uh, John came along and turned that on its ear or maybe even you know, on its head with uh, the whole concept of, of uh, total etch and wet bonding. Um, he's published over 70 peer reviewed articles and abstracts. He's co-founder and past president of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry and is a fellow of the Academy of General Dentistry, the Academy of Dental Materials, uh, the Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, and the Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry. He's received the Christensen Award from the Chicago Dental Society, uh, the Alfred Nabb Award, and Larry Peter Pearson Award, the William Giles Award, and the Outstanding Achievement Award from the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. It gives me great pleasure, and it is my great honor to introduce a great friend and a guy that knows a good bottle of champagne when he sees one. You guys, get ready to get your minds blown by my good friend, Dr. John Kanka. Thank you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm honored that you guys asked me to participate in this. So we've got some really cool stuff to show you. All right, why don't we go ahead? <clears throat> this is We're going to talk about <clears throat> a lot of things today. Uh, one of them is the introduction to bioactive materials, and we're going to show you how what actually constitute constitutes bioactive materials, uh, some past history of this, and then how to use them properly. Our agenda has a number of parts today. We'll talk something about history of adhesives, the birth of the fourth generation. We'll talk a little bit about apex resin adhesives and what I think makes them really so terrific. Some of my experiences at schools uh, <clears throat> doing research on these, <clears throat> these materials and then some misconceptions because there are a whole bunch of misconceptions out there. That I was actually having not actually lectured and because of COVID in a while, I was surprised to learn that some things were still present that probably I thought I'd be taken care of, but nonetheless. In 1988, <clears throat> I had done, well, I'd been studying this uh, topic of acid etching for a long time. And I saw people say, you know, in fact, a colleague of mine, Ray Bertolotti, who I call a six foot seven Hungarian with an Italian name, but he was talking about putting acid on dentin back in 1986. And, and I said, you know, that's, I was taught that was totally wrong. So I actually set out to prove he was wrong. And then having gone through the literature at great, great length and studying every biocompatibility paper written since 1945, I came to the, the epiphany that it wasn't the acid that was the problem. And I wrote a paper about that back in March of 1990 in Quintessence International. But in 1988, we actually started showing that you could use phosphoric acid. And I put together a bonding system that <clears throat> employed phosphoric acid as the, as the conditioner and, and was just put it on enamel and dentin. Then I used the product called 10 year A and B because I liked it and I thought that worked really well. And then for direct restorations, I used Scotch Bond 2. And for indirect restorations, I used Scotch Bond Dual Cure. This was published in the Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry back in 1989. This was the first uh, generation of, first fourth generation material, and it was the birth of the fourth generation material. And what came of this was the product called Allbond. Then Allbond II, 
and so on. But this is this is the genesis of Alban and, and the fourth generation. In 2001, uh, I had met up, I had got connected with uh, Scott Lamoran and Chris Colton at Apex, and together we made a product called Simplicity. Simplicity was the first of the no rinse systems that would actually properly etch enamel and dentin. And this was a, a very, very good product, but we wanted to continue with that. And then in, 19, in 2006, I, we created what I think is probably one of the finest bonding systems ever made was Surpass. Surpass is a, a no rinse version of a fourth generation. It truly does etch enamel and dentin the way it should be etched. And then there's an, just kind of a bulletproof process here because you either leave everything all wet or all dry. And I took out the unknown of how wet wet was or how dry something had to be. And it just eliminated that completely. And that was, <clears throat> that was my goal to create a system that was basically bulletproof and you never had to worry about whether something was properly wet or dry. And that is what Surpass is. <clears throat> to this day, 15 years later, I still think this is one of the best, if not the best bonding system ever made. Now, just so you, I wanna give you an idea of how things work in, in the business. In 2008, I took the product to the University of North Carolina and to Tufts University. And we did a, you know, did accelerated, accelerated aging bond strength studies at, you know, at 60 degrees centigrade. And we tested the materials at two hours and we had 55 megapascals at two hours and bond strength to dentin of surpass. Now that I did repeated that in North Carolina, repeated that at Tufts. And then in 2008, I went to CRA and we got an immediate, all of us, everybody who was there, and I don't have to name names, but everybody who was there got an immediate bond strength of 38 megapascals, which over 24 hours, because of the maturation of the modulus of the composite, turns into 55 megapascals. So I had established and proven in on these sites that this material did what, you know, it did an incredible bond strength, uh, produced incredible bond strengths and performance. Now, you probably never heard any of this. And that's, <clears throat> that's kind of where I'm going with this, is I, I was hoping that the people that, with whom I interacted there who saw these things were, were actually going to tell you what this was, but they didn't. But, and, you know, like I said, this is how the business works, but these were real numbers and that's really what happened. And, you know, to this day, I, I back it. In 2013, <clears throat> Apex came out with a universal adhesive called Superb. But again, I caution everybody that none of these materials, none of these one bottle materials, these universals, you might be able to get adequate bond strength to dentin but you're not gonna get adequate bond strength to enamel. They simply do not have the capacity to properly etch enamel. And you have to know that, and you don't want anybody to suffer for that. Now, I also have a few misconceptions that, you know, I, I, we, we kind of, we did a lecture uh, or we did a summit meeting in, in uh, Wisconsin not too long ago. And, some things came to the front that I thought kind of really could use some straightening out. And so we're gonna clear up a few misconceptions here. And one of them is over etching. There really is no over etching. I mean, if you, I mean, I guess you could, but it would have to go something like three minutes before you'd really start to have a real problem. But the notion that, 30 minutes or 30 seconds over 15 seconds is going to destroy your restoration is silly. That's not going to happen. So if you could go 30, 15, 20, 30, 45 seconds, you're fine. Phosphoric acid is not going to destroy your restoration if everything else is done the way it's supposed to be done. So I just wanted to let you know, you know, just like there was a time if you got phosphoric acid on dentin, you were going to flunk dental school and you're going to, you, you weren't going to pass go and you didn't get to $200 and probably go straight to you know where, but that wasn't true either. And this is not true. There's no over etching. That's not gonna kill your restoration. And second, 
<clears throat> there is no such thing as resin incompatibility. All resins, all the resins we work with are vinyl resins. They go through vinyl, what's called vinyl polymerization. And the ends of these resins, these monomers and, and polymers, they're all the same. There are vinyl ends on these and they, they all bond together the same way. There are certain things that make one resin not bond to another and that could be the acidity that's present on the surface of some of these adhesives that could thwart the effort to make a self cure stick to it because the acid would overcome the, the uh, catalyst system in a self cure. But they are compatible. And if you would like cure everything, they will all be compatible. So there is no resin incompatibility. And then this nonsense, it's called selective etch. I, you know, I spent 30 years trying to destroy this. And, and it keeps popping back up like one of those whack-a-mole things you see. And it cracks me up. You know, you just, you really can't do this. I mean, you can try, but it doesn't work. It is in incredibly laborious to try to feed a bead of phosphoric acid on a gel around a cavity prep and control it. I mean, it's just, it's goofy. In fact, I've got some pictures here to show you about this. And this is the kind of thing that you see. If you look, you know, here in this top left picture, you see that there is acid, there's some places it doesn't really get to. And then some places you have it on, it's clearly on dentin. And this, this is selective etch, right? This, you know, eh, almost, and this, no. You see that in the boxes that the acid is getting onto the dentin and it is the dentin you're actually trying not to etch, but where is it being etched? It's being etched in the most vulnerable of spots. So. This is why this is such a, in my opinion, a charade. And I think this is nonsense. I think, you know, just ignore this. I would not do this. If you're going to etch something, etch it. Uh, if you want, I'm going to give you a later, I'm going to give you a bulletproof method of putting phosphoric acid on dentin and almost no matter what you do with it afterwards, you know, I can give you something that'll make it work no matter what you do. So these are the things that I find, you know, have been misconceived over the years and they're still around and I'm still, I guess I still have to hang around a little bit longer to try to get rid of them. One more, and that's this one here, that I want you to know what, what, uh, what hinges on the success of your restoration. And one of them is the durability of the bonded interface and it's dependent on solvent evacuation. Now, what I mean by that, is that all adhesives contain solvents. They contain either alcohol or acetone. There may be another here and there, but it's either gonna be alcohol or acetone. And the surface that they're being applied to is somewhat moist. So now we have three solvents present. We have water, acetone, and alcohol. And each of these, whenever these are placed, it is incumbent upon the clinician to make sure that that solvent is evacuated from the surface. Because if that solvent, any of those can, re, they retain water in them, the adhesive and the interface is going to degrade. So at some point, there has to be a, a real strenuous drying of, of the, it, the adhesive assembly. And what we have here is one that shows it, this was an attempt to show something a little bit different, but I want you to point, I want to point out the highlighted here, the highlighted text on the bottom. And that says, alternatively, complete removal of water from the hybrid layer is, is, is it should eliminate hydrolysis of the collagen and the components. And yes, that'll happen. So that's what you want to do. Once you place your adhesive on and it's all the layers are on, you really want to thoroughly, thoroughly dry, not gentle dry, it has to be thoroughly dry because the evacuation of the water is what prevents the hydrolysis of these adhesives and the interface. And to kind of give you an idea, I published that, well, this was presented at the IADR back in 2010. This was a three-year uh, study of surpass. And surpass is, like I said, everything's all wet or all dry. 
And once you apply the product properly, the bond strengths in this case, the report here was over three years, but we had taken it out to five and seven years and the bond strengths are stable all through that time. Now we're gonna to turn towards the product of uh, the topic at hand, and that is we're gonna talk a lot about bioactivity. And we're gonna define it. We're gonna talk a little bit of history of bioactivity and bioglass and what bioactivity really is in some of the products in the marketplace. Bioactivity refers to any material that has the potential to induce a response or interaction with living tissues and cells. In other words, it actually you put something in and you get a biologic response to it. There are two phases of this. There's an inorganic phase and there's an organic phase. And you need the, the proper ions in the proper ratios for all of this magic to happen. But bioactivity is something that happens in a biologic environment, in, in vivo, if you will. Bioglass has been used since the 60s to help regenerate bone structures and provide a natural healing mechanism. And it's been verified to release and attract the necessary ions that you need to stimulate hydroxyapatite formation. Because the bottom line is that bioactivity in, in our stage here, in our, in our world, in bioactivity refers to the formation of hydroxyapatite. That's what we're after here. And there have been in the past materials which kind of claim to have bioactive properties such as glass ionomers, resin glass ionomers and geomers, but none of these products are able to stimulate the formation of appetites. Now bioglass, bioglass is 45 S5 or calcium sodium phosphosilicate referred to by its, you know, it goes by the name of bioglass and Novamin and it has a particular ratio to it. And that's kind of really interesting. The glasses here, these are, uh, these are non-crystalline amorphous solids that are commonly composed of silica-based materials and they have other ingredients which are kind of neat. What's interesting about bioglass is it's not terribly far away from window glass. It actually is a relative of window glass but it has less silica and higher amounts of calcium and phosphorus in it. The 45S5 name signifies, it's the, const the constitution of the, of the bioglass, 45% weight of silicon dioxide, and it's a five to one molar ratio of calcium to phosphorus. The ratio of calcium, calcium to phosphorus is what helps pr promote the formation of appetite crystals and then it can act as a crystallization nucleus. Lower calcium phosphate ratios do not bond to bone. And it's considered to be optimal in biomedical applications because it's a similar, it actually is similar to the constitution or composition of hydroxyapatite, which is the mineral component of bone. And you may remember it's also enamel. The history of bioglass is pretty interesting. A guy by the name of Larry Hench was working at the University of Florida in the late 1960s. He was actually working on radiation resistant materials at the time, but he also was, this is during the Vietnam War, and he saw soldiers being injured severely and, and you know, not being able to help them. And what he was looking for, he sought then to develop a material that would bond to bone. And he began funded in 68. He started synthesizing different kinds of uh, glasses and glasses and finally came to bioglass in the 45 S5 ratio. And was found to be both osseoconductive and bioactive. In other words, that glass did stimulate the repair and formation of bone. The first use of the material was for ossicles in the inner ear and it was quite successful. Later, copper, zinc, and strontium have been added in, in small amounts to stimulate bone formation. Now, this is kind of how it goes right here. You have bioactive glass, and when you, you have the attraction of calcium phosphate and carbonate, to the silica gel, it forms a gel on the surface. Now what happens 
is you get, now I'm gonna explain how that happens in a minute, but that's attracted. So you get this silica gel from the, from the, uh, from the silanols that form. And then to that surface, bone forming cells are attracted. And they, these are you know, osteoblasts and they start developing a collagen type matrix. When it's left to go on, you have crystallization of the bone-like matrix and then you begin to form new bone. This is, this is how bioactivity goes. And it was the discovery of that glass that showed the possibility with the, it, it, and we're gonna again talk about what's in it, but it could, be it was so strong this bond that it couldn't be removed unless you broke the bone which was kind of interesting so here's how it goes this is what actually happens the alkali ions on the glass and a part of the glass these are sodium and calcium ions it causes hydrolysis of silica groups now this is once the product is inserted into a biologic environment that's when this starts to happen or Get you part way with artificial saliva, which I'm going to show you in just a little bit. They form hydrolysis of the silica groups. Now, then you have soluble silica and sol soluble silanols form around this glass. And these are going to condense, these condense on the surface. And that is what forms that silica gel that we we're talking about over here. So we have that silica, the silanol groups that condense on the surface. Now, calcium and phosphate are attracted to that surface and they form carbonated hydroxyl appetite. This is kind of the inorganic phase of this, okay? That, this is the inorganic portion of it. And then we'll start to move on. Now we come to the, bio, the biologic process. This encourages growth factors to attach to the bioglass, then stem cells, activate a healing response, they form osteoblasts, which go on to form collagen. And then finally, it's mineralized into hydroxyapatite. This is the process. Now you see that there is both an inorganic and organic process to this. And this is what constitutes, constitutes that. This is bioactivity. Now it is, as we said, a bioactive material is a material that elicits a specific biologic effect at the interface of the material. It remineralizes, we're looking at least, this, it does remineralize the area and it can strengthen, it has the potential to strengthen tooth structure through fluoride release and the other, material, other minerals that are there. And we're looking to form around margins, especially interproximally, form appetite-like materials on the surface of these with the potential to repair defects on that surface. And another benefit, will, and you're gonna see this shortly, is the alkaline environment that this creates. And we're looking, again, we're looking to actually, actually form new, new tissue in, in, uh, on an in vivo basis. And the best place in the world to form this is on these, any potential defects around especially resin composite restorations, but certainly anything you're gonna place in a tooth. Bioactive glasses have some interesting properties. They do inhibit bacterial growth. They can reduce microbial counts. And there's a pretty interesting hint that you may be able to participate in periodontal regeneration. Over the years, there have been materials which kind of lay claim to being bioactive, but they're not, they're not really. We had 70s, they saw the advent of glass ionomers, and then uh, 1980s, resin modified glass ionomers. Now, these had the capacity to release fluoride in, in once abutting a two structure, but it is an ion exchange and it is a simple, well, relatively simple, inorganic process. It does, it can, like I said, prevent, it can create fluorapatite at the interface between the ionomer and the two structure, but it is an inorganic process and it's not bioactivity. And we had calcium releasing materials, again, sort of getting there, but not quite, you needed the right materials and the right, uh, again, the right ratios and that, that wasn't there yet. There was a bioactive, or at least a claim of a bioactive resin in, in 2013, 
but it just didn't have it didn't have the ability to perform the way we would hope it would. In 19, uh, 2014, we saw GMR restoratives. Now, ask yourself, do you know what a GMR is? And most people really don't know what a GMR is. A GMR is a, a resin that's filled with pre-polymerized crushed roundup glass armor filler. So I just want you to know what that is. And then in, Alka, and then in 2017, we saw Alkacytes. Now this, this is got some interest. This is pretty decent. And in 2020, 2019, 2020, we actually have a suite of bioactive materials. Now these Alkacytes, this is from, uh, this is from uh, Ivacar. This is an interesting product and this does do some pretty interesting things. It's not really quite bioactive. It has a lower sodium oxide and calcium fluoride is added, but lower sodium oxide content. And, and it's a powder liquid. It has a place, but it doesn't, it's not a substitute for amalgam. It's not, you know, there's claims to be a universal color to it, but it doesn't, it's not gonna load well uh, or bear loading well because powder liquids just do not have the strength to withstand occlusal loading. So this has potential in certain other areas, but it's, 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 it's not a bad product. So <clears throat> we're gonna talk now a little bit about what we have here for bioactivity. And I see my, my little icon isn't going, but that's okay. Bio, we look at the release of ions from these particular materials and we see fluoride release. This is fluoride, calcium and phosphate release here. And this is against the competitor, sort of a competitor product over here. And you can read it, I'm, I won't name it. But you can see the fluoride release off of the bioactive materials from this to apex is constant and continually increases. The calcium release increases over time as well. And in both products, there is a phosphate increase over time. But this, as you can see here, this continues to increase and all of these are necessary for this. <clears throat> now, current products uh, in dentistry have been associated primarily with the fluoride, with fluoride release and what it does to teeth and fluoraphanite. The newer materials have the potential to actually do something with, you know, do something with actual remineralization and repair in vivo. And that's what we're looking for. And one of the things I thought was missing was the, the link between the, any bioactive materials in a tooth structure. And if you have a non, bioactive adhesive, there's no way for exchange to occur within a tooth uh, of the bioactive materials and minerals and, and for the process to go on. So we actually did create a bioactive adhesive and that is superb, and we'll, we'll talk about that. This is a million dollar picture. The, these are two samples. Uh, what we have on the left is the, is the regen uh, flow, the bioactive version of Titan. This is plain, Titan. Now, both of these were immersed in artificial saliva at 22 degrees centigrade and left there for two weeks. And what you see is something has deposited on the surface of the bioactive flowable. And this is the, this is the carbonate, uh, hydro, carbonyl, hydroxyl carbonated uh, appetite. Yeah, carbonated hydroxyl appetite. That's what you're actually looking at here, these particles. Now these are apatitic. This is the beginning of the process. This is the inorganic process here of the bio, this is the inorganic phase of the bioactive process. And you see that nothing happens on the non-bioactive material. This to me is really, really exciting because we, this is what we hope to see in vivo and then go on to see actual, you know, uh, appetite, hydroxy appetite formation against these little interfaces. And like I said, this carbonated hydroxyl appetite, which I finally was able to pronounce. Vista has also <clears throat> engaged the help of John Burgess down in Alabama to prepare or uh, provide a study here showing the effect of these bioactive materials, one challenged by artificial caries solutions. So what they did was cut box preparations and then restore them with various materials and then subject them to artificial carries for four hours 
and a remineralization, remineralizing solution for 20 hours. And this was cycled for 30 days. Then the specimens were taken out, embedded and sectioned. And I'm gonna show you the results, but let's orient you first. They're gonna section here. They're gonna look at this section right there on the top, as you can see the red circle right here. This is the interface that will be examined. And you can see this is, this is gonna be the artificial caries. That's the, that's the clear stripe over the dentin. That's the erosion that's created by the artificial carry solution. And if you look at A, A is an area that resists the demineralization or the artificial caries. And B indicates an area that did not resist the artificial caries. So these are the two, these are the, the kinds of responses you can have. Uh, and let me show you some of the results. This is, again, this is a positive result. This is, this is the experimental adhesive and experimental composite. In other words, this is like superb and the, and the uh, region flow. And what this shows here is that this has been very successful at resisting the artificial caries challenge. This is the caries challenge. This is the demineralized surface right here, but it's now stopped at this point. And what they did is they drew a line across here, across the bottom of that, and measured the area underneath these, and then determined they could do on, on a statistical, statistical basis, show you how much protection was offered by this. Now, this was, again, the, this is the reference adhesive reference composite over here, the RA and RC. Now, what these indicate is that you have a negative response here. You can see the positive response up on the left, and the negative response is that this eroded away clearly into the tooth. Now, before you ask, you notice how these are kind of pulled away from the, from the restoration. Now, what happens here is when these specimens are sectioned and then embed, or they're embedded and then sectioned is the dentin dries out. And when the dentin dries out, this is what you kind of see. You kind of see that separation from the surface. So that's why that's happening. But I want to show, again, let's go back. And we show here, this is the one of the competitors. Uh, again, you can sort of guess what it is. This is a negative response. This was that competitor with uh, a negative response and there was no adhesive. Curiously, over here with the AC with add, as you see down here on the lower right, the adding the adhesive to this product did make it more successful than it was without an adhesive. That's pretty interesting stuff. So the bottom line is this, without a not with a non-bioactive adhesive and non-bioactive flowable, there was no protection against the artificial caries. Having the bioactive adhesive was helpful. Having just the bioactive flowable was even more helpful, but having the two together was a synergistic success. It resulted in an in inhibition zone 241% larger than the non-bioactive restorations. So this means that basically what you want to do to have this kind of result is use the bioactive adhesive together with the bioactive flowable. And for me, that means the bottom of every single class two restoration gets the bioactive adhesive. And I use, I use the, the bioactive flowable, the regen flow in the bottle, in the bottom of those boxes. And I bring it up along the axial walls of the restoration as far, it get very close to the surface uh, but not to, not to the load bearing surface, but along the walls to provide this kind of response. And we're gonna see more of right here in a minute. The bioactive materials afford not only, you know, just resistance to artificial caries, but they have the ability to create around them an alkaline environment and that is also just really good for a couple of things. It's really good for tissue response and it's good for resisting bacteria and it can actually uh, neutralize bacterial attack. So we're gonna go on to the second one and we're gonna, hopefully you're gonna see the video that we're gonna have here. Now what is happening, I mean, I'm hoping we have that, is that the video shows the addition Right here, you have on the left-hand side of this divided screen, this is the region uh, fillers that are in here. 
then these are non-bioactive fillers on the right. And when lactic acid is introduced to these, both of them will turn yellow initially, but the regen side, if again, hopefully you can see it, the regen side goes back to pink, which indicates it's returned to a neutral or alkaline pH. So the fillers have the capacity to neutralize an acidic attack. And this video went on for an hour and acid was continually added to that and it continued to neutralize that acid. So we have the potential here to place these restorations with bioactive materials and especially in, in, in truly vulnerable areas. And then, and I'm gonna, I'll share something with you later. I'm, although I know the flowable is not meant to be a wear resistant material, you know, we all have cases that are kind of hopeless and patients that are very difficult to deal with and get them to clean their mouth or they can't clean their mouth. I am putting these things in all class fives and class threes in that uh, it, because this is their best chance. I mean, you could use, I mean, you could use something like a glass animal as well, or you could possibly use an alka site, but this is what we're doing. And, and the tissue responses to this are very, very interesting and very productive. The adhesive, just the point of this uh, slide is to show you that the addition of the bioactive fillers does not impair in any way the bond strengths of the materials to the tooth surface. And that's the message here. It's, it's equal to or better than pretty much anything on the market. This is the current suite, and I do say current, because we will be expanding the suite of bioactive materials uh, in the not too distant future. If you look at these products, you see Regen Self-Etch. <clears throat> Regen Self-Etch is the bioactive version of Surpass. And this is to me an advancement. This is a progression, uh, an improvement over the original Surpass, which I do think is a wonderful, wonderful material. Then we have Regen Universal. Regen Universal is the bioactive version of Superb. And Superb itself was a terrific and is a terrific adhesive. But the addition of the bioactivity to it, in my opinion, makes it just fantastic. And on the bottom left, you see Regen Flow. Regen Flow is the bioactive version of Titan. Titan was a is a marvelous, marvelous material. In fact, Titan lends itself to all kinds of uses. The bottom of boxes, it can be used as, it was so strong and I used it as a core buildup material routinely because it just was immensely, immensely strong. And on the bottom right, you see the Regen Pit and Fisher. So we have a Pit and Fisher sealant that is bioactive in nature. And if I am placing a pit and fisher and I, and I do every now and then. I'm gonna etch the tooth, dry the tooth and directly go, you, you could use an adhesive. If you're gonna use an adhesive, I would, I would use a bioactive adhesive or you could just apply the pit and fisher directly into that uh, etched surface with nothing else and, and let it go and you know, light activate it and you're done. And that's a terrific way to go. Now I'm gonna give you a few bulletproof bonding uh, protocols here, a couple of them. If you follow these, and I've already vetted this out with some of my friends, uh, we're gonna show you what to do and how to make this work really, really well. Now we're gonna first use Regen Universal. This will be our first protocol. And number one, you apply Velvet Etch, and that is the etching from Vista Apex. And we're gonna talk about that. That is an incredible, incredible etch. With this etch, with velvet etch, you can apply this on a cavity 15 to 20 seconds and get a really good etch of dentin and enamel. You can, you need not use an air water spray to remove this. This can be removed with about a five second water stream only. That's gonna come right off and it's gonna come off cleanly. I was, I tried that a few months ago and I was just dumbfounded how well that worked. But that, that, and so you're not spritzing and spraying and creating a big mess everywhere with this, that works great. 
So we apply the cavity, the velvet etch to the cavity 15 or 20 seconds, then you rinse and dry. Yes, you dry. And then what I would encourage is you apply using a small micro applicator. Now a micro applicator, you know, everybody calls them micro brushes. Micro brushes have bristles or they're little balls on the end. But a micro applicator is the one with the little ball on the end. That is an apl micro applicator. You use a small micro applicator and put on a coat of Desensimax. And we're gonna tell you what, a little bit more about Desensimax in a little bit, but this is a desensitizer that has the ability to shut down uh, MMPs. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it, but it, it does it. But you apply a real thin coat of the Desensimax using a micro applicator, leave it wet. And then apply three brushfuls of the Regen Universal to the cavity. Now this is gonna first, be much more voluminous than you're used to because that's the nature of the product. It's gonna have, a, it's gonna seem like there's a whole lot more stuff than there really is. After you apply the three brush holes of that, you're gonna dry this. Hold the high, high volume suction near the cavity prep. And then what you do is you dry this gently at first and then bring the air syringe and just kind of so you're not blasting everything over the place. Kind of dry it at first gently and then bring in the syringe and dry it real thoroughly. And then you can light activate this for depending on the, the unit, the, the device you're using between three and 10 seconds. I'm using a pink wave uh, at a turbo mode and that's, I use, then it activates in three seconds. But if you're using a standard uh, mode, it'd be about 10 seconds. So either one, it's gonna work. Then apply a thin layer of region flow to all of the dent in the cable surface margins bottom of the prep, bring it up the axial walls, cover all of the dentin, and then light, act light activate that. Now that's light activated for, again, depends on which light, which kind of, what kind of irradiance you have, what kind of power density you're using. But if I'm using the pink wave, I'll use two cycles of three seconds each at turbo mode for each of these layers. You might use 10 seconds or 20 seconds if you know, using something uh, less powerful. If I'm using the standard mode, I think 10 seconds will do it in the standard mode with a pink wave. If you're not sure if, about what you're using, then go 20 seconds. And then, you know, insert the composite following this incrementally, each of the layers between three and 10, 10 seconds, depending on what kind of power source you have. So this provides, this, this is bulletproof. This is absolutely bulletproof. You follow this, you will never, you're never gonna have sensitivity. I mean, just, you're never gonna have it. Now, let me go on to the Bulletproof protocol number two, actually I should say two. And that is the Regen Self-Etch, which is the bioactive version of Surpass. First, you dry the prep and dry, dry, dry. If you're using Surpass or, or Regen self etch you want to start with as dry a tooth as you can. And that sounds, may sound a little contradictory, but you gotta trust me on that one. Then you apply Regen bottle, S, Regen SE bottle number one, agitate this for 15 or 20 seconds, and you leave it wet. You do not rinse this, you do not dry this. You leave it stay wet. Then you apply three coats, three brush rolls of Regen SE bottle two. And just one after the other, just apply them on, slobber them on. And then you dry this very thoroughly, very thoroughly, because now you've got to get rid of the solvent and the water that is present on the surface. And you dry this really thoroughly to evacuate that. And the drier you, the drier you make this at this point, the better restoration you're going to have. Then you apply a coat of the Regen SE bottle number three, and you can air, dry, air thin this as much as you want. It doesn't matter. It's going to polymerize. It's going to give you really, really high bond strengths. And then, but you know, so air thin as much as you like. Then you light activate it. <clears throat> Again, if I'm using the pink wave, I'll use this in turbo mode, and I can light activate this in about ten seconds or uh, three seconds. If it's lesser power, you can go ten seconds. Then again, just as we did prior, uh, one or two millimeter layer of region flow, all of the dentin, cover all the preparation up to and including the cavo surface, bring it up the axial walls. So the 
axial walls then have the benefit of having a bioactive restorative material at that surface. And then light activate this again, either two cycles of turbo mode pink wave or 10 or 20 seconds with your normal light. And then add the composite in there incrementally, again, between three and 10 seconds per layer, depending on what you're doing. Pulse activation is indicated, and we don't probably have enough time to really cover that here, but pulse activation works with any of these lights. You can, some of the pink wave, you can turn it on for a second and then shut it off. So if you're tying, especially larger enamel margins together, you want to, you definitely want to do pulse activation. And then you go ahead and finish it. And then what I'm going to do now is show you this in action. Although I, because of the time constraints, I was not able to incorporate, say, the velvet etch into this. I wish I had a video to show you. I wish I, I could show you the video that I have about how nicely that rinses off. But nonetheless, what we did we use here were, was very good etching that came from Ultradin. So we're gonna place a restoration in the mesial of this maxillary first molar. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we've cut into the preparation. You can see that there is indeed a uh, carious lesion and it's pretty extensive in there. Now we will stain this using you know, carries indicators, uh, red or green, whatever your desire is, it's fine. If Christmas we use both, uh, it's kind of fun. So, any of the areas that remain stained like this are to be removed. And so we get them all cleaned off. And now once the restoration of the cavity prep is complete, we will add a matrix band to this and you know, use whatever matrix band is necessary to seal the cervical margin. I mean, of all the things you gotta look at, it's that cervical margin and these restorations that matters. If it doesn't, if it doesn't you know, seal particularly well up here, that's no big deal because you can fix that. You can you can you can do, you can work with that. But here, down here in the cervical portion of this, <clears throat> you really do need to have good adaptation. So we'll place this matrix, and then as you can see, we have a wedge in place and then a V3 ring. And these V3 rings are still absolutely outstanding. Uh, this one comes from uh, Ultradent, and it's you know just I, I love these things. They're absolutely marvelous. I first saw the uh, prototype of this in 2005 in New Zealand when uh, Simon showed them to me. <clears throat> and I said to him right then and there, I said, yeah, we'll probably use these things because it really looks like it's gonna work. And ever since then it has, and it is a mainstay in my office. So if you look, you will see that the cervical matrix has adapted really, really well to that surface, to that cervical area. Now I'll apply the etch, and this is an this is an alternate etch, and it's it's a very good etch, but I, you got to try and you got to try an alternate etch. But so here's the etch, and it goes on for you know 15, 20 seconds. That's great. If it goes a little longer, that's fine too. Don't worry about it. We're going to rinse it off, and we're going to dry it. Now you want to dry this pretty thoroughly. So we are drying this pretty thoroughly. And you can see that everything is really nicely frosted on here. And that tells you you've done a good job with that. And then we're gonna apply a little bit of Desensimax. And again, using a small <clears throat> micro applicator, you can apply just a coat like this. That's all it takes, a thin coat of this to the surface and you leave this wet. <clears throat> As is true of both uh, Desensimax and all the, uh, su uh, the uh, Regen Universal and Regen SE bottle too. You wanna to shake all those bottles before you dispense the materials. But we have the Desensimax in place. And then we're gonna place, this is Regen Universal. So we've shaken the bottle and then we're gonna put out some and dispense three brushfuls into the cavity prep. And as I said before, you can see that there is, it looks like there's quite a bit of material in there. But once you start about, start to air dry it, you can see that it all kind of goes away. And so now you have the bioactive adhesive and you've evacuated all of the solvents that were necessary to be removed. Then we light activate this for three to 10 seconds. And then we're gonna apply the bioactive flowable in here. And if you ask me uh, during the q and I'll tell you about doing both together because you can. But for right now, we're gonna say here we have a layer of actually a couple layers of flowable, the regen flow. And you see it comes up and I take it up. I take them up the axial walls because I want all of that area that's vulnerable to be protected by the bioactive process. 
this is light activated for, you know, again, the turbo mode, probably six seconds or 10 seconds in regular mode. And then we start building it up. And I typically will do the box first. So we develop a box and then that makes smaller the volume in these in this area in particular. And then we can place the composite in there, pulse activate this, and then we'll take off all of the paraphernalia around that, the matrix, the wedges and bands and stuff, and then finish it. And there you go. There is the restoration. And this is what this is exactly how I want to see things go. Now, I see futures for this. I see taking white spot lesions, cleaning off the organics, uh, the inorganics out of here, say something using something like clean and boost, and then just smearing in some region flow into this in a very thin manner. You know, you can help arrest some of these lesions. There's a whole bunch of really cool things that we're, we're going to be able to do with this. And, you know, interproximals, I'll show you how they might benefit. We've all seen restorations when we've cut into adjacent ones that have these kinds of margins. You see them here, you see this, and you see this. This, this is exactly the thing I'm hoping to prevent. This is what I want to stop. I want, these are the areas that have the potential to see repair and remineralization. That's what I want to have. And, you know, when you have, a class two that's adjacent to another tooth that hasn't been restored. If you have the bioactive material here at the surface, it can actually aid the adjacent tooth. It can actually impart some of the bioactive process to the tooth in which it is in contact with. And so again, there's some great things you got to consider. Now, just a, you know, a couple of the products we have a little few minutes to talk about. Velvet Etch is a phenomenal product from Vista and I had nothing to do with its development, but it's great. And you can, as I said, it, can, it stays where it's placed and you can rinse this off with a water stream in five seconds and try that out if you wish, if you'd like to. It's, it's just a marvelous thing. We have a zirconia primer that is the best on the market. This material is very simple. You can, if you want to bond on zirconia restorations, and I've done a lot of partial restorations now out of zirconia because I'm comfortable that I have a strong bond to them. And we would, just, I would sandblast the inside of the restoration or clean it with uh, sodium hydroxide or not, not beg your pardon, not sodium hydroxide with chlorox, hypochlorite. You don't need sodium hydroxide, is what I was going to say. What you can use is sodium uh, is is just hypochlorite and clean the inside out, rinse it, dry it, put a layer of the zirconia primer on there, then either a layer of surpass two or a layer of superb, in, or use the bioactive versions of them. The the Regen Universal, put on a coat, thin it out, light activate it. Then you're going to have an immediate bond strength to the zirconia. I mean immediate and very high and very stable over time. And then if you're using the bioactive product, you already have built in a little bit for the margins of that restoration, which is kind of nifty. This is the pink wave light. It has several modes to it. There's a boost mode, there's a standard mode, there's a ramp mode. It is about 16, 15, 1600 milliwatts per square centimeter power density in standard mode and about 1700 uh, in, in boost mode, and which is where I kind of use it all the time. It has, you know, it has a trans illuminator built into it and it's got a lot of really nifty features. It has the spectrum, it can encompass spectra, spectra from uh, between about 375 to 900 nanometers, which means it's gonna get the ultraviolet, near ultraviolet things, uh, uh, initiators like phosphine oxides, and it's gonna get CQ initiators up around 440. So it has a broad uh, spectrum of activity. It also has near infrared, so it goes up to 900 nanometers. Now that actually provides a little bit of heat. And you know, and this goes back to something we looked at probably 25 years ago. If you actually have a heat source uh, along when you're trying to light activate a composite, you actually can reduce contraction stress and you actually can, the stress is in the shrinkage, but you actually lower the shock of contraction stress, which is fascinating in and of, my, in and of itself. Uh, CR did an evaluate 
uh, the pink wave and actually came out excellent. I think this is the, frankly the best of these uh, light curing devices present here because it has a 12 millimeter lens on it, which is the biggest lens that is present there at all. And it has excellent to good from uh, spot uniformity. In fact, it's excellent. And this is really important if you have any distance between the tip and the tooth. So uniformity kind of becomes really, really critical in these cases. And where some of these others are not so hot, you know, and, and lasers, I'm not a big guy for lasers. Um, I looked at lasers years ago. Um, this is about a 4,000 milliwatt laser. I looked at them and they did some interesting things. And I wanna show you what, and I'm not gonna say that this one necessarily does it, but I did look at a laser about 25 years ago. And I put in a high modulus composite and I light activated it, you know, bonded it in, light activated. And this is what a laser did, the laser that I had, and it came from a company in Utah. And not only did it crack the composite, it was this, the contraction stress is so severe that it not only cracked the composite, it actually cracked the tooth as you can see here and here and here. You know, so I've not been a big fan of lasers ever since. I think they're hard to control. They're, you know, monochromatic. You have one just a narrow band that you can, you can use with in them. And I heard this said, you can cure one time, you can cure composite from across the room. I find that a little bit on the goofy side because I don't know anybody who's gonna be checking a patient, you know, one a hygiene patient, in one room and, and curing somebody's composite across the hall. I, I don't know. A couple other products. The Sensimax uh, was a top 100 product in, uh, in a magazine here. And uh, what I want you to know about that is that it has all kinds of antimicrobials. It has fluoride, it has uh, chlorhexidine, and it has a desensitizing element in it. Uh, it also has a product, uh, an ingredient in there that will shut down matrix metalloproteinases, it shuts them down. So if, if there's a concern about that, this will shut them down. Then there's Bond Saver. Bond Saver has all the ingredients except for the desensitizer. Now you have to, you, you don't want to use Bond Saver if you are using a resin modified glass ionomer or glass ionomer or a, or even a, you know, zinc phosphate cement because this desensitizing element in there will prevent those cements from etching themselves in, into the tooth. They'll act as a barrier to that. And so Bond Saver has all of the other ingredients in that. And this is what we use just before we cement teeth. We use Desensimax when we've prepared the teeth and we applied the several coats of Desensimax to the prep. But on delivery, I use Bond Saver for that. For that, because I'm going to get all these other ingredients in there, the antimicrobials in there, the MMP killers in there. And that goes on day of delivery, not that. Then there is seam free, which is kind of a jackknife of all trades. This is a sculpting resin, wetting resin. This material will not light activate by itself. That's what, that's its value. You know, you're not gonna have layers of unfilled resin. You're not gonna have polymerized unfilled resin at the top of the restorations. This will only polymerize when it's covered by something that can be light cured or self cured. Once that's covered and the material over it is, and, and it's activated, this will polymerize instantly. So this is unique in its abilities. Then there's clean and boost, which is another thing that you can use for a lot of products. You can use this for, you know, prepping, cleaning, it'll take salivary pellicles off. If you're is like me and you like stretching things, you got somebody covered in plaque, you can apply this and it'll just apply it to the plaque and it'll take plaque off like you won't believe. It's kind of a lot of fun to use. This is a really neat product. So bioactivity is eliciting a specific effect at the interface of the material. I think these materials we've talked about, they represent a sea change to me in dentistry. These are actually keeping me in dentistry because, you know, I was, you know, COVID hits and you're kind of going, well, is it near the time for me to go? But then, you know, you, then you create this and all of a sudden you create this and you get excited again. And that's what John and I were talking about before. And just, it's, it's hard to, for me to back away now and, and leave it behind because this is, to me, this is an excitement that I've not seen in a long time. We have the potential ability to heal defects and actually repair teeth and have more confidence in restorations 
and you have then more reliability and predictability and durability of restorations, which I just think is great. And then we have better outcomes. And that's what we're in the business for is better outcomes. And you know, that is something that's just absolutely critical. And so all of this is about nothing less than performance because performance is where it's at. And if you can get better performance from restorations, I mean, everybody benefits. I know it's a, we may be in a changing times, but you know, I'm, I'm gonna be that dinosaur that wants very badly to maintain the best of standards and, and give to my patients the absolute best that I can. And as long as I'm around doing it, that's what I'm gonna do. And so what I'd like to leave you with is uh, some words of wisdom from one of my favorite philosophers and it's Dean Martin. And Dean Martin said that good judgment comes from experience. And he said, in experience, well, that comes from poor judgment. Yeah. And I've always, always loved that. And so with that, I'm going to thank you for attending. And I'm going to hand it back to John. And I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much, John. Um, you know, it's kind of funny that Dean Martin, I, I do love Dean Martin. And I, and I love his philosophies. My, my grandfather used to say, son, experience is what you get three seconds after you should have had it in the first place. <laughs> and that is so true. Yeah, that's true. Well. Yeah. yeah, it's the old thing of what happens if I do this crack and and then <laughs> then you realize. Um, so, gosh, thank you so much. Um, I will vouch for um, so much of, of, of what Dr. Tank has said here. I use a lot of uh, the Vista Apex products. I use the Pink Wave. Um, I use their, their bonding system. By the way, John, I wanted to let you know even though you didn't help in the development of it, I absolutely love the Velvet Edge. Um, oh, isn't it? It's fantastic. I, I, it's probably the best. Yeah, Did you the try best. that yet? Did, did I have you trying that yet? The five second, just water stream? No, not yet. But I thought oh, it's Monday morning for me now to try that. Yeah, I said, have to try that. Probably the best testimony I have about the Velvet Edge is that um, I bought one round of it for myself. You know, I thought, well, let's just try it yeah. and see what I think. And one of the uh, one of my assistants was working with me, and she was she's like, "This, this stuff's purple," and I, I said, "Yeah, it's it's purple. It's a different edge." And so she was like, "Oh, okay." And then it, I don't even know, you know, how word spreads in the office. And the next thing I know, I guess maybe she told the other dental assistants in the office that I had this purple edge. Well, we've got a three doctor practice, so the next thing I know, um, I'm I'm getting word back from everybody where it's like. Where, where's where's more of that stuff? And I was like, I bought a little, little tiny, like a four pack as a sample. Well, you got to get more of that stuff because, you know, we love it. And without, you know, any kind of, hey, you guys should try this. It's great stuff or anything like that. It's just word spread like wildfire about Velvet Etch and just how, you know, how good it really works. So, like I said, I, I, I know you didn't have anything to do with it, but you're a consultant for Vista. So you can just pass that along to them and let them know what a, Tremendous Absolutely. Purple. And, you know, I found my crew always it really gets a kick in it. They like the purple color. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, such, a, it's, such, a, it's such a change it from is. everything else. It's like, it's it purple. And it's really, I mean, blue is pretty easy to see, but the purple is, is really easy to see. And the consistency of it is, that's the phenomenal part to me, is it yeah. just stays where you put it. It stays where you put it and then it goes away readily. Yeah. And of course, a lot of what I do, I learned from you. So, um, you know, I like doing a total edge technique and I, I like the fact that I don't have to worry about a lot of things, you know, the, the whole sensitivity issues and stuff. So, uh, so thanks for that. And, you know, it, it's funny too. I, I was thinking as you were finishing up, John, you said that, you know, you were kind of thinking about dialing things back, you know, kind of slowing down and you know, putting your feet up on the front porch and, you know, and there, there was a, a, a magazine article I read a couple of years ago that said something about most geniuses do their best work before 30. And 
I think it's because when you're younger, you know, before you're you know, perhaps married or before you have a family and you just don't have as many priorities, you know, pulling you every which way. And so you've got more time to just, you know, get impassioned about something and just lock in on it. But it is cool how when something, you know, like bioactivity comes along that it just like triggers that thing, you know, where you're like, I, yeah, I, I can't give it up now. This is, this is too good. And, uh, you know, I think it's really neat that, uh, you know, I'm not a surfer, but I will say that you've kind of caught a second wave and you've kind of triggered a second wave, which I think is pretty awesome. So those of you watching, you know, I promised you that you would hear some pretty cool stuff that you hadn't heard before. Um, and I think my buddy John delivered on it. So John, you know what, thank you so very much. And like I said, we're gonna have a, a lot of interesting information for you. Um, you know, this afternoon, I, I do have, I do have one question for you. You know, one of the things that we always hear about um, the whole bonding thing and, and the wet bonding is, is the Zen aspect of it, you know, where it's, you know, wet, but not too wet, dry, but not too dry. And, you know, everybody kind of thinks, well, what's it, you know, what's doing to that? With the whole thing of, I understand the concept of the collagen fibers and everything, but can you just briefly kind of explain to me the whole thing of like, when you really dry things, is it simply the chemistry that follows that gets those collagen fibers, you know, back to a state where you can grab onto them better microscopically? No, actually it's the, the water the wetness that actually reconstitutes the surface. When you've etched it, you have a lot of collagen fibrils, you know, like, you know, like that when they're wet, but when you dry them, they mat down. And the more you dry it, the more they mat down. So if you've etched it, they actually, it becomes a physical barrier to the resin actually being able to permeate that. Okay. So by keeping it wet, it's sort of like when your hair is underwater and your hair kind of floats, right. the collagen fibers come back up. And now you can introduce a solvated primer or bonding system into this. And that's what chases the water out. And it chases the water, replaces it without drying these fibers away. So it gets through and into the tubules and into the, into the etched dentin itself, you know, without the, you know, this is no longer a barrier. So that's what allows wet bonding to actually work. So, but again, I, what I gave you, you know, here was, something bulletproof that you could actually dry it, but you're going to re-wet it using the desensitizer. Right. And that will both desensitize and reconstitute the surface. So that eliminates the problem. But then in the, in the surpass or the region SE, you, you, there just wasn't any worrying about it because nothing ever got dry. Right. And so okay. you started dry, which is what you want to do, but then nothing in between was ever dry. It was either all, you know, dry or all wet, but there, were, there was nothing to think about. Okay, because the Desensimax, that stuff is, I mean, you know, ne never mind, you know, the whole idea of regen, which is game changing. But the, the whole thing with Desensimax is, you know, like a separate game changer all into itself. It, I, we've used that in a lot of different applications and we always have, it, it's just, I mean, I'll steal your word. It's like bulletproof success with that stuff. It just works. Yeah, yeah it works. It works really, really well. And, and when I said, I mean, we had situations, you know, where somebody's come in and we all see these from time to time where a patient walks into your practice and they're from another practice and they say, you know, they did these two fillings, you know, or whatever, and they were done a year ago and I'm still having sensitivity with these. They're still bothering me. And that's like know, magic to my ears, honestly. That's magic to my ears to hear that. Yeah. It's just like, have a seat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we get to I'm the going to pick. Yeah, we've got that protocol and people are like, oh my gosh, it's the most amazing thing. And I mean, my big deal is not really me, you know, it's just what I'm using. Yeah. But, you know, if they want to heap praise on me, who am I to argue with them? Yeah, yeah. yeah. really. I mean, you know, that, that's a nice thing is that, you know, you, you basically never have any phone calls. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, nobody's yeah. ever going, I, I always ask, how is that restaurant? Oh, it's fine, dude. you know, and, it, and I love that. I mean, that's what I want. I mean, you know, I want not to hear it because it was successful and they're better off for it. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, so now what I think is good too, is, you know, when, when somebody comes into your office, oftentimes, and you've done the restoration yourself, 
with the sensitivity, then you start running through all those things of, you know, could it be the curing light? Could it be contamination? Could it be my chemistry? There's all these things. You know, once you get this system in place, it fixes all of that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so if it makes the curing light better, it makes yeah, everything better. <laughs> it does. Because now if they're having pain, you pretty much know, okay, I need to maybe, you know, I'm, I'm not as, okay, it could be one of 10 things. Now I'm down to like, it could be one of two. And yeah. it makes the problem solving piece of the decision matrix, you know, becomes almost a straight line. Not all these, you know, things that yep. if then and go and cross over. And some, it's amazing stuff. So thank you uh, for that. Pleasure.